Hey guys, welcome to the Aviation Surf podcast. And today on this episode, we've got Shubham Gupta, uh, who is currently in Cranfield University as the Chief Executive Officer for Space Resources Laboratory Limited. He has done his uh, undergraduate studies from mechanical engineering in SRM University in India. A further went and got his masters from Cranfield University in astronautics and space engineering is currently a chief executive officer for space resources laboratory and got endorsed as exceptional royal talent by the royal academy of engineering and from the uk home office as well so shubham please introduce yourself and where are you currently and how's the uh, united kingdom weather treating you right now uh, thanks janet uh, thank you very much for that introduction i think you you've said pretty much everything about me uh, uh, i don't think i need to introduce myself but uh, guys uh, i'm shubham i'm the ceo and the founder of space resources laboratory uh, which is uh, a space subsystem provider based in the united kingdom Mm-hmm. And we specialize in the uh, propulsion system for the small satellite industry. And as Junaid mentioned, uh, yeah, I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in astronautics and space engineering. So yeah, and we're based in the UK. And to answer your question, how's the weather treating us? It's okay. It's like always. You know what we say uh, when anybody asks how's the weather? We say it's wet and grey, and <laughs> that's and that's pretty much it for uh, all year round so shubham why did you choose the space industry and space career in the first place and what influenced you towards choosing this career path can you please elaborate on that i think i was always interested in space since my childhood when i when i was very sure that i wanted to be in the space industry is uh, when i started working on this uh, student satellite uh, program called srm sat uh, this is basically a student satellite mission uh, based at SRM University. I was working for SRM Sat 2 as the uh, lead design engineer. Uh, and that mission is basically uh, a uh, successor to SRM Sat 1, which uh, was India's first student satellite uh, that was launched in space. And I'm very proud to say that it's still orbiting the Earth and, and sending data. So, yeah, I, I worked on its successor, which is basically a mission to... Uh, uh, the low lunar orbit using articulated low energy transfer. And when I started working on it in my uh, second year at my bachelor's, I, I was so involved in it. I was so invested in it that I was very sure that I wanted to go uh, forward with this um, in my life. And this is what I wanted to do uh, as a career choice as well. And this is what actually led to me uh, doing astronautics and space engineering from Cranfield University. And uh, one of the reasons I didn't choose generic aerospace engineering because I, I wanted to be very sure that I wanted to go in this uh, space engineering. I see, you know, that is one of the reasons why I actually got you on board. You have, you're an inspiration to a lot of space enthusiasts, space scientists out there. And your career progression has gotten to a level that not a lot of people can actually compete with it. Uh, so before we proceed with how did you found the space resources laboratory what actually got influenced you to choose mechanical engineering as your undergraduate studies uh, thank you very much for your kind words Junaid. first of all and uh, what led me to uh, doing um, mechanical engineering was i think uh, it was always there in the family um, science in general uh, was always there in my family my uh, my grandfather was a, a professor at ISM Dhanbad, and my maternal grandfather was a civil engineer. My uh, father is a mechanical engineer and my uncle is a mechanical engineer. So it was pretty much there. The environment was pretty much set up for me. And I myself was very interested in mechanical engineering as well, physics in general, mechanical, and which basically led me to do, uh, doing mechanical engineering. I mean, when I, when I was uh, writing my entrance exams, um, uh, initially I did get confused about what field I would like to go uh, to, but uh, I think all in all, I was uh, able to figure out that I wanted to do mechanical engineering. This is what I've been interested in all my life. Uh, let's let's continue with this. <laughs> I see, you know, you've got, you got influenced towards mechanical since very young. Fun fact, actually, even my dad is a civil engineer. And uh, so I got very much influenced by my father and, you know, being into his work ethics, his uh, way of living and the amount of hard work he does is what influenced me to become an engineer in the first place. Now, Shubham, can you please share your experience towards your degree uh, in mechanical engineering? If you want to, you know, summarize enough how the whole four years went through. So it was it was amazing, actually. Um, uh, like I said, I was always interested in mechanical engineering and it wasn't something I was doing for the sake of it. 
Uh, and also, like I explained, when I was in my uh, second year at uh, SRM University, where I got my uh, bachelor's, uh, I was working on SRM SAT, and most of the times that's where I used to be. There used to be a joke around uh, that uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, teammates uh, of uh, at SRM SAT, uh, we used to just live inside the lab. And it, it wasn't even an exaggeration. There, uh, there were times when we would live in the lab for days because we were so invested in it. I think that is what made the experience even more special, uh, where I could actually uh, see myself utilizing my skills in mechanical engineering. Yeah, that's that's what made my uh, bachelor's journey, uh, uh, I think, so enjoyable, so amazing, and, and, based, and carved a path for me uh, uh, to do my master's and then uh, found this company as well. Amazing, amazing. So uh, now you've gotten your bachelor's done and you've gotten uh, the mechanical engineering uh, as an undergraduate study. Uh, now, how did you proceed on to choosing a master's program and where, why did you actually get hold of uh, Cranfield University in the first place and why did you choose this program? Uh, why didn't you choose elsewhere in the United States or might as well just in other countries like how students are doing right now? And they apply everywhere. They apply in the European sector. They apply in the Canadian sector as well. So why did you choose Cranfield uh, to be your place of your master's program? There are a few reasons, uh, the couple of reasons. And and I think there were things which, which just led me to, uh, to doing this. Uh, one of the things is that, I, like I said, I always wanted to do uh, my master's in the space field. And that's why I was looking at universities uh, and places which are good at uh, providing co courses uh, in the space uh, in, the, in the space field. And Cranfield is ranked one of the one of the top university uh, ranked as one of the top universities in in, in the space in the space engineering field, uh, not just Europe but across uh, across the globe. And why not US? Why UK? Uh, is it, it it has uh, its own uh, merits and limitations, I believe. Uh, of course, uh, U.S. in terms of uh, financial numbers and eco uh, economics, uh, obviously the U.S. is much bigger, uh, if, even if you consider the space industry. But there are lots of hurdles for people coming out of uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, there's something called ITAR, which is a regulation preventing uh, foreign nationals to uh, from doing a lot of things in the aerospace field. And in fact, most of the people cannot get uh, a job in the core aerospace field if they're not uh, American nationals. That was one. And the other thing was even if ITA was not a thing and uh, it would, even if it would have been easy to get a job, I think um, I would have still chosen the UK uh, because uh, I like the UK in general. Uh, it's, it's nice and quiet and peaceful, uh, whereas I find US a little loud. Okay. In terms of yeah, in terms of looks and 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 how you when you when you when you're in the US, you feel uh, you get a vibe. There, you know, the country is very loud, very active, and everything. But I like it the other way. I like nice and small and peaceful. I see. You know, choosing a master's program has a lot of variability in it. Uh, you have to choose the country where you're actually very comfortable living in. Uh, so I guess that's one of the reasons why you choose uh, United Kingdom. I hope the weather doesn't uh, hurdle you towards you know staying back in the United Kingdom uh, in the coming years itself. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't mind uh, the 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 cold part of it. I, I like it actually. Um, I'm used to living in the cold, so it's fine. Uh, what I would like is uh, I would like a little bit of sun as well. We get we get maximum of. 10 days uh, of sun a year, unless we have some sort of heat wave. So yeah, it's it's like, I, I, I remember this April, it was snowing here out of nowhere. And the week before that was 21 degrees. Okay. <laughs> so the weather is so unpredictable. And, you know, uh, weather is such uh, a common thing to talk about here. Everybody j is just obsessed with the term weather in the UK. <laughs> but yes, U UK is nice in general. And uh, one more reason that uh, uh, led me to choosing this particular course at Cranfield, not just the UK, was because of what the degree is called. It's astronautics and space engineering. And uh, how many people get uh, get to call themselves astronautics and space engineer? <laughs> Just a little perk, yeah. <laughs> and now coming back to the words choosing the master's program, can you can you share why did you choose astronautics and space? Like you've said before, you've chosen Cranfield uh, to be one of the top most universities. And why this specific program? Cranfield University is very 
uh, specialized towards aerospace programs. So why did you choose this module itself? Uh, were the subjects that actually got yourself interested in or were the industrial links that Cranfield has? Uh, what actually influenced you uh, towards choosing this specific program in this specific university? Because uh, aerospace uh, is, uh, is, is what uh, Cranfield is known for. Cranfield is so reputed in uh, across the globe uh, for for its work and its its ties in the aerospace industry, but uh, I think I I always wanted to be in uh, this uh, in the space field itself, and I didn't want uh, any generic aspects of aero uh, coming in between. I wanted to be very uh, I wanted to do specialization in uh, the space uh, industry itself. You know, even for example, if I was designing something, I would want to design it for the space industry and not for aerospace. I don't mind, but if I'm studying, I might as well study uh, something that that uh, where I can specialize in space. And why Cranfield? I mean, the, there's there's so many reasons. It's it's nice in terms of its course. The course structure is amazing. It's got an uh, it's got an airport where we get to fly planes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sponsored by so many uh, uh, big names in the industry uh, and it, it's ties when when you actually come to uh, Cranfield uh, you will realize that the ties it has it's it's so wide that whenever you go to one of these uh, companies uh, every fifth guy four, fourth or fifth guy you see there is from Cranfield and I'm not even exaggerating which is very nice if you're looking for a job which is a uh, which is what most people do. I think uh, it is it is amazing, as long as uh, the uh, immigration laws are not uh, hampering your chances of getting a job. I think that is a big uh, plus for Cranfield University for choosing Cranfield University. Amazing, amazing. They have got a very strong alumni. That's what you were saying. That's actually a very role towards choosing a university in the first place. Now, Shivam, you have you have given us your experience towards your. Uh, undergraduate studies and uh, can you share a little bit of experience during your master's program the one year program you took at Cranfield University as an astronautics and space engineer uh, what was the whole experience towards it how difficult was the program and how did they structure it and uh, I don't think so there were online classes for you back then right no, 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 no. We had the full experience. We we utilized every uh, single uh, opportunity we got for, uh, maybe for whether it was for grasping knowledge, whether it was for uh, visits to uh, industries. We actually uh, got to visit Airbus Defense and Space uh, as soon as we came in, which was amazing. Uh, you know, we got to see the Mars rover, uh, which was which was just brilliant. Uh, but yeah, we we got to enjoy every single thing that that was offered at Cranfield. Uh, and uh, masters in general, um, and the, and the good thing is that you, you have just one year masters here in the UK, so you save uh, a year's time. Uh, but yes, we uh, we used to have proper classes. We we used to have various uh, group projects, group design projects, fun projects. You know, like uh, uh, we would be given uh, rocket motors, and we would we would be asked to use all the available items around us to build a build a rocket. Uh, and actually uh, recover the booster. Uh, oh, amazing! So it, it was it was just amazing. We had to, we had to uh, use uh, all the items that were around to build a parachute that could recover the booster, the, the first stage of the rocket. And uh, yeah, th there was a competition as well. We didn't win, but <laughs> the experience is what matters. To be honest, like you said, uh, that it is a one year program at Cranfield. When you see like most of the universities out there in different countries have like two year master now does that actually make it very intensive during your course at Cranfield and you know uh, the the two year program syllabus has been squeezed and made it to a one year program how does it happen and do you feel uh, like it has its own drawbacks uh, as a one year program um of course uh, it's a little hectic because you have to study the same num uh, same amount of, uh, of syllabus i think it's doable it's doable. It's it's uh, uh, what happens is it's usually uh, the way it's structured is that it's uh, divided into three terms. But the first two terms would be your uh, would be your normal uh, modules and your exams or assignments, whatever your course is structured uh, as. Uh, 
And the final term would be your uh, industrial thesis or your uh, university thesis, whatever you choose to do. So it's a little hectic, but uh, in the end, you save a year's time. And because it's doable, I think it's it's all right. One of the reasons why people choose other countries for international students, especially that they give you, you know, work permits, you get, they give you a few years to actually look for jobs. Now, back then, when you had actually got in your master's degree, what was the struggle of looking for jobs once you have done? And what was the process like? I'm assuming uh, that the uh, United Kingdom hadn't uh, released the postgraduate visa. Uh, so back then, how did you uh, look for jobs and how, what was the struggle like and what was your experience for looking for jobs? That's one of the hardest things for the international students. Uh, true, true, Junaid. I mean, uh, uh, like you said, now you've got post-study work visa here for international students. But back then, it was... Uh, a huge struggle for anyone uh, coming out of the EU. The thing is, you know how uh, it is for other countries. You, uh, for, uh, you're you doing two years uh, master's and then you have three years of visa as well, where you can work on that visa or you're, you're allowed to at least find a job which will help you switch to a work visa. But that was not uh, that's uh, not the case in the UK. You get four months of extended visa uh, and that's just, in case you need to uh, apply for an extension to submit your thesis because your thesis might be too intensive or or, or whatever the reason is uh, for, for the extension request. But uh, that, that used to be the case. And even in those uh, four months, it was very difficult because back then what happened was 2012, this, this law, I believe in 2012, this law was uh, uh, brought into force. The company who, who, which needs to hire you needs to have a license to sponsor your visa. And when I say sponsor, it doesn't just mean uh, paying a fee to the government. What it needs to do is it needs to uh, it needs to un- uh, undergo something called the RLMT, Resident Labor Market Test, where it has to prove to the government that it cannot find anyone uh, suitable for that particular role from the UK or the entire EU, which is very unlikely. So it wasn't very easy. And there were times when, you know, I would apply for a job. Uh, I remember I, I used to uh, apply for f- around 40 jobs a day uh, in 2018. There was a time I used to apply for 40 jobs a day. And uh, the, they only had one problem that they wouldn't sponsor the visa. And uh, in in October 2018, I, I came home. I, I just wanted to be home for a while. And then on my email, I got I uh, I I, um, I got a message from someone that okay, there's this particular job role, uh, and would you be interested? I said, are you going to sponsor the visa? And they said, yes, we would be happy to sponsor the visa, but uh, you have to come to the UK to give the interview. And the interview was in what, two or three days after that. So I immediately booked my ticket and flew to the UK right away. I was still uh, in jet lag when I went for the interview. I got, I went through uh, two stages of the interview and I cracked it. But then what they said was, uh, we cannot give you the job because uh, we feel that you might leave us for something better. So we will not be sponsoring your visa. We will not be giving you this job. They were basically trying to say that I was overqualified, which sounds very nice, but it's, it's not really nice when you're facing it. And when you're looking for a job, it's 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 not the best thing to hear. But it's nice to say now that okay, I was uh, I was rejected because I was overqualified. <laughs> At the end of January 2019, I I came back to India. I uh, somewhere I always knew that I wanted to uh, come to uh, come back to the UK and do something. And uh, even then, I was not very sure if I wanted a job. But uh, I I was applying for the job, but uh, I wasn't very. Um, keen on actually getting a job. I just, uh, I, I always wanted to do something on my own. So anyway, uh, I, I was in India, I was applying for a couple of jobs as well. I'd always been thinking about uh, uh, starting my own venture in the small satellite industry. And then I started working on it. And But it, you know, at that time, there used to be this little problem. They used to have graduate entrepreneur visa at that okay. time in 2019, which they ended in, April, no, sorry, June or July, something like that. They ended in June 2019, I think. So the problem was uh, to get that visa, you have to show 50,000 pounds in investment. And obviously that wasn't very easy to show that you've got 50,000 pounds in investment already. Uh, 
So that year, they, they started changing the rules. They started, uh, so they introduced this new visa called the startup visa. They would give you the visa for two years. And if you've got 50,000 pounds in investment uh, in the first two years, you've cre- and you meet certain criteria, uh, uh, I think if your company has performed uh, to a certain extent, you get an extension for three years, and then you can apply for uh, permanent residency or indefinite leave to remain here. But so I thought, oh, all right, I will apply for this visa. I started applying, uh, but there was this other visa called the exceptional talent visa, which had which said there will be no restrictions if you get this visa. The catch is that there's just 150 seats for all fields of engineering combined across the globe. It wasn't it wasn't very easy. I did apply for it. It took about 10 months for me to get uh, a reply from the Royal Academy of Engineering. And I, I like to say that I was one of the fortunate ones to get it. And yeah, but I started this company in July itself uh, while uh, my visa was already in process and I didn't know if I would get it. But yes, I had started this company while I was sitting in India. It was registered here itself. And I came back to the UK in October, 2019. But the scenario, like you've asked, uh, how is it going to work for people now? Uh, now, after Brexit, laws, uh, lots of uh, you know, a lot of laws have changed, and uh, I believe it's been eased for people who are outside uh, from outside the EU. Um, now, everyone's treated the same, and even if you're from the EU, you have to get a visa to work here, and that's why it's a lot easier to get sponsorship from the company because uh, if they if they cannot find somebody suitable from the UK. They might as well recruit some uh, someone who's coming from India or Japan or any Asian country because it's going to be the same for them uh, uh, if they're recruiting an Indian, Japanese, or someone from the EU. And they also get two-year uh, post-study work visa now. So uh, for the first two years after completing their 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 masters, they uh, they don't have to worry about visa. They can work on that particular two-year extension period. And uh, in most cases, the company will extend your uh, contract and sponsor your visa as well. So it's a lot easier now. It's a lot relaxed now. Uh, it's, it's much more favorable to come to the UK to, do, to actually do your master's if you're looking for a job. Understood. You know, I'm very glad that they actually introduced these uh, graduate visas, which are very needed for students, if, uh, especially international students who spend a lot of amount to get their master's and, you know, they look for jobs elsewhere. Now, uh, Shubham, like you've told your entire career progression and, you, you know, towards the struggle of looking for jobs and especially uh, the way you, are, you had dealt with it. Uh, one of the key aspects why you didn't give up uh, towards coming back to the United Kingdom. Uh, can you give us a few tips and tricks for uh, the international students who are, who are in the United Kingdom and who are uh, going to start their master's in the few coming months? When you, when you come, uh, come into the UK... Uh... The, uh, the, there's something called graduate programs where uh, companies are looking to recruit recent graduates uh, uh, for about two years. And most companies would actually sponsor the visa as well during our time if you get into the graduate program, which was not the easiest to get into. But yes, yeah, so there's something called these graduate programs, which uh, the applications usually start in mid-October or something. So uh, what my advice to the students is when you come into the UK, uh, get your CV sorted, make it, uh, you know, tailor it according to the UK standards. Try and make it in both Word and PDF format uh, because a lot of companies, what they do is they use this uh, PDF, uh, sorry, uh, CV filtering software, uh, which, which only works with Word files. And if it, uh, if, if it doesn't work, uh, if it doesn't shortlist yours, the software, you wouldn't go through uh, uh, to the next rounds. Start applying as soon as the applications open. There's so many applications which start opening up from uh, mid-October and they usually close around uh, third week of November. So it's very important that you apply then and then uh, work on uh, how you would uh, work on the uh, interview process and everything. But uh, yes, you, you come into the UK and you start, you start applying for as many jobs as possible. Look where the jobs are available. When you come into the UK, make sure you're applying for the job you're, uh, you're qualified for because otherwise 
you might not end up getting one. So that is uh, my advice to you. And also try and uh, visit all these career fairs you have at universities, even at Cranfield. As soon as you come in, you will have a career fair where all of the uh, companies will come in and they will uh, uh, present their company to you. And this is this is uh, a very nice thing. This is a key difference you would see uh, between India and the UK. In India, you uh, sit for campus interview. Yeah, you You would go to the company and try and sell yourself. Uh, and here the companies would come and sell themselves to you, come and join our company, which is very nice. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my advice. Start applying immediately. And uh, a lot of uh, people actually connect with me on LinkedIn and they ask me, how is the job prospects? If I do this course, will I get a job? Well, the truth is no one can answer if you will get a job. And if that's the only purpose of you doing a master's, then you might not uh, want to do one. Because if you if you're doing do, do it for for learning and and then applying your knowledge, uh, and then trying uh, try and get a job, yeah. Now, what does Space Resources Laboratory in depth does, and uh, can you please elaborate on that to the viewers out there who may not be able to figure it out? So, what does the what does your company are focus on? What are, what are the basic aspects of the company itself? So, Space Resources Laboratory is basically a space subsystem provider. Now, to uh, translate this into uh, very simple uh, terms, so you, for example, if you have a, a small satellite, the the entire system is uh, is uh, an uh, amalgamation of so many different subsystems. For example, you've got solar panels, you've got antenna, you've got uh, uh, you've got a battery, you've got payloads, you've got structure. And, and various other things, right? You've got reaction wheels. So these are different subsystems for, uh, for, for a small satellite or for any satellite. And what we do is we build these uh, some of these subsystems and our specialization is in propulsion systems, mostly for attitude control of spacecraft. And uh, so for people who understand attitude control, uh, 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 they they know what I mean, but for people who uh, who don't know, uh, uh, every satellite has to maintain a certain orientation uh, in its orbit uh, in different phases of the orbit. For example, the antenna has to face the Earth, the solar panels have to face the sun, and just to speak in simple terms. So what our propulsion systems or these attitude control systems in general do is they help position the uh, spacecraft in, in the correct orientation or correct its attitude basically so that's what uh, we're working on amazing to be honest coming back uh, towards the journey as an entrepreneur uh, what was your overall experience of uh, you know starting this uh, startup and you know getting yourself funded itself and what was can you if you want to summarize it in a very brief manner uh, what how was the whole experience as an entrepreneur well it's tough but it's amazing and I don't think there's anything else I would do. Um, and the thing is, I know it's tough, but you're in a race. You can win or you can lose, but, but to know that you have to finish the race. So once you finish the race, you might as well uh, know, okay, do you want to continue this or not? I, I see, you know, you've summarized in a very uh, brief manner. And what is your strategy towards uh, gaining that amount of exposure like other companies and, you know, getting yourself funded itself? What What is your upcoming strategy in the, in the following years for Space Resources Library? So our product, the product that we're developing for Propulsion System, uh, it's under this. Uh, so the project under which uh, we're developing this is called Project Aribat. It was basically named this because uh, uh, it was uh, Aribat is the inventor of zero and we wanted to uh, honor him. And we know we all know how important uh, zero is uh, in engineering and in general. So this project is called Project Aryabhat, and uh, this propulsion system that we're developing it's going to be a first of its kind. Unfortunately, I will not be able to give uh, you know give you a lot of information about the about the propulsion system because a lot of information is confidential. But if I have to sp speak in simple terms. Uh, it's going to be a smart propulsion system, which will have certain features, which is, uh, you know, which are going to make uh, the current uh, attitude control propulsion systems obsolete, we believe, uh, if, I, uh, if I may say so. Uh, yes, uh, it's still in development and we hope to uh, secure the funds to, 
develop the prototype. Once the prototype is in, we hope to uh, uh, perform all our uh, tests and uh, simulations and hopefully get it launched uh, in the near future. Amazing. All the best to you, to be honest. One last question to summarize the whole topic for the upcoming uh, aviation and space entrepreneurs who want to, uh, like a startup like yours, like Space Resources Laboratory, what uh, tips and tricks would you like to give them? So the first thing is you have, you have to start. And if you don't start, you know, you know, see, the thing is, if you dream, it might come true, it might not come true. But if you if you don't dream, it's definitely not going to come true. I might be just speaking uh, uh, in a way that people be like, okay, he's being too philosophical or something. But uh, this is something I have done, and I think it's it's a very practical advice. If you really want to start something, you have to just go for it. And the thing is, we're humans. Uh, this is something I tell all my friends. We're humans. Uh, we'll figure out a way. We always have. We always will. Amazing. You know, no matter how many hardships that come through us in this life, that we all there's always a way out, to be honest. There's always yeah. uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. And like you said uh, earlier that you have to start. That's the reason, uh, you know, I, I had this podcast idea like during my 10th and 11th standard itself during my high school years uh, that I had to, had to do something as such. Uh, but I never got in the way of actually doing it. One of the best tips uh, that I've, I've ever received uh, so far right now. So this is something my father says. This is one of the advices he gives me. And I, I thoroughly believe in it. What he says is, if you have to regret, then do the act, do the deed, and then regret. <laughs> Don't regret uh, about the fact that what if I would have done it? Now, Shubham, we are uh, at the end of this podcast right now. We've got a few rapid fire questions for you if it's, uh, if it's not an issue for you. No, no, no. I hope not. <laughs> I hope I don't <laughs> mess this one up. The first question I wanted to ask you is, uh, what is something you always wanted to become if not astronautics and space engineer? What is an alternate career path for you? As, as a kid, I wanted to be an IAS officer, but I think that was just as a kid. And then once I got into the engineering field, I was always so much invested uh, in, in, in the space industry. I always wanted to be uh, uh, in this field. And hopefully one day I could be an astronaut as well. I know that this is not a space related question, but uh, which is one of the best airlines you've ever been through? And Emirates. I I've, I got that uh, answer like in my last podcast as as well. They are you know very straightforward and you know they they give so much preference to customer experience. That's one of the reasons why they rank so high. Yeah, they they know how to treat you. They know how to. Treat you. No one's no one's even come close to that. One of the countries you always wanted to get your masters done, other than United Kingdom. Possibly uh, New Zealand. Uh, can you please elaborate on that though? I know it's a rapid fire question, but I. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um. Why New Zealand is because one of the we uh, reasons is weather. It's it's nice and cool. It's like I said, it's small, peaceful. It's beautiful. Uh, and New Zealand is actually uh, the country which gave me, uh, where I received my first offer for master's from. Yes, I ended up uh, rejecting the offer because the, by then I had received an offer from Cranfield as well. So funny story, actually. We were out. I, I was actually treating my friends for getting uh, an offer from uh New Zealand from University of Auckland and uh, while we were waiting at the station at the train station uh, I got an email stating okay uh, uh, you have an offer from Cranfield as well so yeah but yes New Zealand uh, thank you so much Shubham for coming over and sharing your experience uh, from your master's degree to becoming one of the founders at Space Resources Laboratory and you know sharing the journey the sharing the struggle of you looking for jobs the reason of you choosing to become an astronautics and space engineer itself. So thank you so much for coming over to this podcast and sharing your experience with the viewers out there. Thank you very much for having me, Junaid. It was, it was lovely speaking to you. And hopefully uh, some of the students who or some of the people who are watching this will get inspired and uh, they will uh, want to do uh, uh, pursue their career in the space industry because right now the space fraternity is very small. We need more people uh, in the space industry. And it's so small that everybody knows everybody. It's like that. Thank you very much for having me. All right.